In this week's classes, we've been looking at the emergence of chaotic behavior out of periodic behavior for the nonlinear damp driven pendulum. In the first class this week, we looked at the emergence of chaos and it's through the eyes of uh, phase space diagrams. In this class, we're going to look at the emergence of chaos through the eyes of new diagram, Poincaré section plots. Both of these give us a way of visualizing, of picturing, understanding that transition from sort of periodic periodicity of the pendulum to uh, chaotic behavior of the pendulum. Uh, if you remember from last class, I mentioned there's two ways that we can approach chaos in the damped driven pendulum. Uh, one way is through the frequency of the driving force. The other way is through the amplitude of the driving force. So in the previous class, we approached chaos by changing the frequency of the driving force. In this class, uh, we're going to approach chaos by changing the um, amplitude of, of the driving force. And finally, I wanted to stress again that the chaotic behavior of the pendulum is a feature of the nonlinear pendulum, the nonlinear second order differential equation describing the pendulum. Chaos doesn't emerge in the case of the linear, linear pendulum described by a, a linear ordinary differential equation. Okay, so firstly, a quick reminder of the phase space diagram, and then I'll introduce the Poincaré section diagram. So the phase space diagram was a way of visualizing, picturing the evolution of the damp driven pendulum's motion. In the phase space diagram, we plotted the um, angular position of the pendulum versus the angular velocity of the pendulum, which completely describes the state of the pendulum as a function of time. When we did that, we saw chaotic, when we saw chaotic motion in the phase pace diagram, we saw a sort of dramatic chaotic trajectory in the phase space diagram. So the phase space diagram clearly showed chaotic behavior. It showed the drama of chaotic behavior. But it's difficult to interpret because phase-based diagram is it's overflowing with information about the chaotic behavior. The phase-based diagram plots the trajectory in phase space as a function of the continuous variable of time t. The, in the Poincaré section diagram, we plot the state of the pendulum only at certain moments in time, only at certain points in time. Specifically, we, we plot the coordinates of the pendulum, theta and phi, uh, only once per cycle. Now, when we plot it once per cycle, that cycle we can choose to be either the cycle associated with the natural frequency, so kind of the natural period, or it could be the cycle associated with the driving frequency and kind of the driving period. Now, when we start exploring Poincaré section plots and we're just looking at an undamped pendulum and then a damp pendulum, we'll use the natural frequency. It's the only frequency that we have for the un, undamped pendulum or the uh, damp pendulum. But when we start to add a driving force and we have a driving frequency, then we'll make the Poincaré section plots for the um, uh, by sampling the coordinates, by sampling theta and phi at the period of the of the driving force rather than at the period of the, um, the, the, the natural period. And often when we make a phase space diagram, 
will often start the plot not at time zero say when we switch on the driving force but rather at some delayed time after the transients have vanished so that helps also to simplify the um the phase space diagram and simplify Poincare section plots is to wait for the transients to disappear and then just make the plot when you've got steady state. So in some of the examples I'll show today, I'll, I'll be plotting from time zero in phase space diagrams or Poincare plots. In others, I'll be waiting for the transient period to vanish and then just plot the Poincare plot or phase space plot when we're in steady state. That's often helpful when you're interested in how a system evolves to chaos and uh, looking at the chaotic behavior of the system. Okay, so just a reminder, this is the second order differential equation for the damp driven pendulum that we'll be solving in today's class. And we'll be solving it in this particular notation here, in this particular terminology here. Uh, so there's a natural frequency. Uh, it's given by square root of the ratio of the acceleration of gravity to the length of the pendulum. Uh, I'm gonna call that natural frequency omega naught. I'm gonna set it to one radians per second in everything I do today. Then there's a damping force and a driving force. The damping force has a, a, a single parameter associated with it, a damping parameter. The driving force has two parameters associated with it, the amplitude of the driving force, alpha, and the frequency of the driving force, omega f. Uh, when I work with the examples today, I'm going to express the damping constant beta and I'm going to express the um, driving frequency omega f in units of the natural frequency, in units of the omega naught. So if you see beta is 0.25, or if you see omega f is 0.67, that's in the units of the natural frequency in my examples today. As I say, with this equation, which involves damping, and driving, damping forces and driving forces, uh, we can relax it to just a simple pendulum with just a restoring force by setting beta and setting alpha equal to zero. So it's a kind of limiting case of this um, full equation. Okay, so on the next few plots, the next few slides, I've got some examples of phase-based diagrams and Poincare section plots. So we can get to see the relationship between the two because they're highly related plots. I'm going to start with just the simplest pendulum. There's going to be no damping force. There's going to be no driving force. Uh, and then we'll add the damping force and look at some different cases of the damping force. So all this is to get us used to uh, thinking in terms of Poincare section plots, phase-based plots. Each time I'm gonna show you two, two diagrams. This one upstairs, which is three-dimensional. This one downstairs, two-dimensional. So the one that's upstairs has theta and omega in a horizontal plane. So these are the Param these are the quantities that describe the state of the pendulum, its angular displacement, its angular velocity in the horizontal plane. And then I've got time vertically. So as time goes by, we climb up the vertical walls of this diagram. And then the plot below is to imagine you were in a helicopter above the three-dimensional plot, looking down on the three-dimensional plot, collapsing time in the three-dimensional plot. You're just seeing an overhead view of the three-dimensional plot. So you're seeing um, in my plot here, angular velocity vertically, angular displacement horizontally, and you're seeing the, um, the state of the pendulum and the trajectory of the pendulum. So those are the diagrams I'll be showing on the next few slides. So for the simple pendulum, what do we see? In the top plot, 
you know, just swings backwards and forwards, left and right, through the equilibrium point. And that motion is described by this helical path, helical path in this three dimensional plot. So each swing backwards and forwards, we execute an elliptical orbit here. And each swing backwards and forwards, time evolves a little. And so we see this red line here, this helical path, as the motion, the trajectory of the pendulum as a function of time in this space of theta and phi. So this is like a expanded phase space diagram. The blue points are those moments, once per cycle, once per natural frequency cycle, once per natural, natural frequency period, that I sample the theta coordinate, the phi coordinate of the pendulum. So at these moments, which are separated by one complete natural cycle, I'm just sampling the coordinates of the theta thigh coordinates of the pendulum, and I get this, this sort of path of vertical points for my simple pendulum. And so that's kind of an expanded Poincare section plot. In the lower plot, as I say, I'm, I'm viewing this situation from a helicopter above the three-dimensional plot. The red line is the phase space trajectory where I've sampled the theta and phi coordinates continuously as a function of time. And the blue point over here on the uh, right-hand side, that's a, a superposition of lots of Poincare section points piled up on top of one another, uh, where at those times that I'm sampling, at the times in the si cycle that I'm sampling the um, theta phi coordinates of the pendulum. And so this is the Poincare section plot in blue. This is the phase space plot in, um, in red. Okay, so for the simple pendulum with no damping, with no um, driving force, the, the phase space plot, and the Poncari section plot aren't, aren't that interesting, I would say, but they are a useful reference. They are a very useful reference for what we're going to see in more complicated cases of the pendulum. Okay, so now I've switched on a damping force, and its parameter is beta equals uh, 0 0.1. So this is an underdamped situation where the, the damping parameter is smaller than the um, damp, the, the value of the damping parameter is smaller than one. We're below critical damping. So in this case, we're going to get oscillations to and fro, but they will slowly die out depending on the value of beta. Same two plots, three-dimensional plot upstairs, uh, two-dimensional plot downstairs. Three-dimensional plot has um, theta and phi in the horizontal plane, and then time evolves vertically. Uh, the two-dimensional plot is if I'm in a helicopter above the three-dimensional plot, and I'm looking down on the three-dimensional plot and, and watching the trajectory in phase space through the, the, the red line, which continuously describes the trajectory in phase space, and through the blue points that when I've sampled this phase space at, at these particular cycles. So in the uh, upper plot, as I look at this red line, I see the motion of the pendulum, the state of the pendulum in theta and phi, in angular displacement and angular velocity. And I see it oscillate to and fro. And I see that the amplitude of those oscillations is dying off until eventually the pendulum is located at the equilibrium point and uh, is at rest. So that's the red line. When I sample those phase space points for every cycle where a cycle is the natural frequency period, I see this sequence of blue dots. And this sequence of blue dots, you can think of it as a, it, as a path from where the pendulum started to where it is ending up. Um, at the equilibrium, at rest. So it's a second way of viewing the, the motion of the pendulum. When I look down from the helicopter, 
on top of that three-dimensional plot, I see this more traditional phase-paced plot. Again, angular displacement horizontally, angular velocity vertically, those two coordinates completely describing the state of the pendulum. I see the trajectory in red in phase space, the continuous trajectory. I see the path uh, in blue, the Poincaré sections, the path that it takes through each cycle of the pendulum. So I've got two more plots like this that I just wanna show you. They're the other cases of damping. They're the critically damped pendulum and they're the overdamp pendulum. And I'm gonna move through those fairly quickly uh, because they're just two more examples of looking at um, uh, phase space diagrams, looking at Poincare section plots. <clears throat> so when you have critical damping, there are no oscillations. When you have critical damping, the pendulum moves, if you've displaced it, say to the right, back to the equilibrium point in the quickest path possible. That's what we mean by um, critical damping. And that's what we're seeing in these two plots, the three-dimensional plot upstairs, two-dimensional plot downstairs. In both plots, again, we've got a red line that describes the continuous trajectory in phase space of the pendulum as a function of time. And then we've got a series of blue points, which describes the... Um, the trajectory of the pendulum through phase space were just sampled at that natural frequency period, just sampled once per cycle. So that's kind of interesting for this critically damped system. It's going to be especially interesting when we compare it to the overdamped system. So we release our pendulum at this point on the right of the upper three dimensional plot. We release the pendulum at this point on the right of the uh, lower plot. This is the coordinate, this point is the initial coordinates of the pendulum. So um, my pendulum in these two examples had zero initial velocity, zero initial angular velocity. It had um, uh, a displacement from the equilibrium that was point, point 0.1 radians. So we see that in these two initial coordinates. And then you see in this red path here, the pendulum basically swinging back with decreasing angle, moving back with decreasing angle towards the equilibrium point at zero. And you see it upstairs and you see that swing backwards. It's now moving and it's moving just simply backwards towards the equilibrium point. And that's what the pendulum does in critically damping. It, it swings back along a smooth path towards the equilibrium point and eventually comes the rest. When it comes to rest, you see here, look at this stack of Poincare section points. For each time we're sampling the position of the pendulum, each cycle we're sampling the position of the pendulum is at the equilibrium point. It's just sitting there, it's just come to rest. All those points are stacked up in, in this single point on the two-dimensional plot. And so you see here, it, within two cycles, this pendulum has simply come to rest at the equilibrium point when we got critically damping. This is the case, the corresponding case, the comparison case of overdamping. So again, like critical damping, in overdamping, the pendulum doesn't oscillate to and fro. Rather, the pendulum just swings back towards the equilibrium point. But when it swings back towards the equilibrium point, when it's overdamped, where the resistive forces are greater, it's going to take it longer to swing back to the equilibrium point because it has to overcome greater resistive forces. So it's going to swing back slower. And it's going to take more cycles, natural frequency cycles, to swing back. And so you see those features in these, these two plots. So let me make a few remarks about the plots. This point here over on the right, the top plot, this point over here on the right, the bottom plot, that's the initial coordinates of the pendulum. It had a displacement of 0.1 radians from the equilibrium point. It had no initial velocity. When we release it, it picks up some angular velocity so it can swing back. 
But look, the angular velocities are tiny. So it's moving very slowly back towards the equilibrium point because there's large resistive forces uh, that are uh, resisting its motion back to the equilibrium point. So we see very tiny angular velocities here on this axis in the lower plot. We see very tiny angular velocities here on this axis in the upper plot. We see as it swings back along this red path that the blue points, there's lots of blue points. That's telling us in both plots, the upper one and the lower one, there's taking many cycles many natural frequency cycles to swing back to the equilibrium point. It's probably taking 10 or more natural frequency cycles to swing back to the equilibrium point. It's only when we get to this longest times that we're plotting, upstairs here on this, this upper plot, or over here in the top left corner on this lower plot, do we have the pendulum finally back at the equilibrium point. So it's a it's a clear demonstration on this phase space diagram on this Poincare plot that the pendulum uh, takes a long time to swing back with these large resistive forces to the equilibrium point when you have this over damp situation. So now I'm going to show you some plots, Poincare section plots, phase space plots for the case of um, a driven pendulum. When I drive the pendulum, I've got two parameters. I've got a, um, a driving frequency, omega f, and I've got a driving amplitude, alpha. In all of the plots I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna have a driving frequency, omega f, that is 0.67 mean is 0.67 of the natural frequency. So it means it's not on resonance. It's some significant way from resonance. And we're going to keep that value for all of these plots. For the amplitude of the driving force, I'm going to increase it. So I'm going to start with a smaller amplitude of the driving force, and then I'm going to increase it. When I start with a small amplitude of the driving force, then we're still gonna see this uh, a simple periodic motion of the pendulum. When we increase the driving force, we're gonna see transitions of the motion of the pendulum away from a sort of simple sinusoidal periodic motion. Firstly, to a periodic but non-sinusoidal motion, and then ultimately, to more complicated, even more complicated periodic motion, um, for example, called period doubling, finally to, to chaos. So we're going to see this path, this road from simple sinusoidal oscillations to chaotic motion. I'm going to show you this through these four plots that I'll be showing you for different values of the driving force alpha. So upstairs here on the left is that three-dimensional plot. Horizontal plane is the phase space of the angular displacement and angular velocity coordinates. And then vertically is time. So we see the, the full motion of the, of the pendulum expressed in this plot. Uh, adjacent to that plot on the right-hand side, Upstairs, I'm plotting the angular velocity. Upstairs, I'm plotting the angular displacement versus time. Downstairs, I'm plotting the angular velocity versus time. So angular displacement is in blue versus time. Angular velocity is in red versus time. So those are a simpler plots. We met those last week and allow us to quickly see what the position of the pendulum looks like as a function of time, what the speed, angular speed of the pendulum looks like as a function of time. Downstairs here, I've got a couple of phase space plots. So the one on the left, uh, I show the, in red, the phase space plot for the pendulum. And then the blue points are Poincare sections where I sampled at the, at a regular cycle, at a, at a once per cycle, uh, uh, where the cycle is corresponding now to the uh, period of the driving force. So those are these points here. 
The one on the right, you see the same um, phase space diagram in red, but when I've sampled um, the theta and phi coordinates for the, the Poincare section points, I've waited, I waited a little for the transients to die away and just sampled the Poincare section points when the pendulum is in steady state. So in this particular case, I might have waited, say, 25 seconds. I can see that upstairs here for the transients to die away and then just start sampling the um, coordinates of the pendulum for my Poincare section points. Now, in this case where I've got a small driving force, what do we see? Basically, we see simple sinusoidal motion uh, for the angular position, simple sinusoidal motion for the angular velocity. We can see it in these plots on the top right of theta versus time or omega versus time. You can see it in um, uh, this three-dimensional plot here. You can see the ellipses or the helix as the, um, the pendulum swings backwards and forwards and it evolves in time. But actually you also see in these plots that there is this transitory period at early times, maybe the first 20, 25 seconds on these plots on the, on the right-hand side. You can also see it here, the first say 20 seconds in this plot on the uh, left-hand side, where the pendulum is sort of acknowledging the presence of the switched on driving force, responding to the presence of the switched on driving force and, and working its way to a steady state in the presence of the driving force. Uh, you can see this most clearly on the phase space blocks below. So on the one on the left, this is where the pendulum starts from. This was the initial coordinate of the pendulum, a displacement 0.1 radians, a zero velocity. You see the pendulum swing in this sort of arc shape. And there's only after a turn or two that it gets on this sort of regular steady state where it's driven by the driving force. So there's a transient period here, which we can see by this, um, this arc. We see this on the plot on the right too. We see this arc and then the pendulum reaches its steady state. <clears throat> but an important point here is to compare the Poincare section points on the left and the right. So on the left, we plotted all Poincare section points, sampling once per driving force period. On the one on the right, I've ignored the earliest ones when we weren't in steady state and just plotted the later ones when we were in, got to steady state. So if you look here on the one on the left, this is an early point of Poincare section points. There's another one upstairs here that's an early point of Poincare section points. I have eliminated those in the plot on the, on the right-hand side. And so we just see this single Poincare section point, which is characteristic of simple periodic motion. Okay, so now I'm going to increase the driving force. I'm going to make it much larger. So in the previous plot, the driving force was a small fraction, actually, of the restoring force. Now I'm going to increase the driving force and make it essentially comparable with the um, re restoring force. And we're going to look at the motion that emerges here. So in this plot, I got driving force of 1.05. The four plots are the same four plots. Three-dimensional depiction of the motion of the pendulum over here on the top right. Theta versus time, omega versus time, those simple plots over here on the, uh, this is the top right. And then I've got the two phase space diagrams, the one on the left here and the one on the right over here. Uh, the one on the left, I'm plotting the phase space for the entire duration and I'm plotting the, um, Poincare points for the entire duration of the pendulum's motion. On the one on the right hand side, I'm removing the transitory period and only plotting the um, phase space path and the Poincare section points after we've got to steady state. 
In this case, that might be a, a hundred seconds or so. Okay, so what do we see on these plots? Well, maybe we'll start on the top right here. We see for theta, there's some transitory period um, where there's a, you know, a, a rather irregular motion. And we see in omega, there's some transitory period while there's an irregular motion. So that's the uh, transitory period. But on the right hand after these two plots, we see we've got rather periodic behavior. Now, interestingly, it may be periodic behavior, but especially if you look at um, the angular velocity, it doesn't look like it's exactly sinusoidal behavior. So we have made a transition in steady state here um, from what in the last plot was periodic and sinusoidal to what is here, periodic but not sinusoidal. You can see this also in the three-dimensional plot on the left. We've got this irregular motion of the pendulum where it loops the loops actually in both directions during early times. But then after 100 seconds or so, it settles down to some steady state motion, um, some periodic motion in, um, in this phase space of theta versus phi as a function of time. We get a bit more quantitative when we look at these phase space diagrams. So the one on the left, remember I'm plotting the phase space and the Poncari section plots for all times. The one on, this is the one on the right. The one on the right, I'm plotting the phase space uh, path trajectory and the Poncari section points only for times after the um, transient period. So the one on the left, which has all times, has this complicated irregular transitory period. We see it in this path here on the right hand side of this plot. Uh, and we see it in these points here on the right hand side of the plot. But eventually the motion converges onto this oval here and the Poincaré section points converge onto this point up here. And we can see that if I remove all the transitory period from this plot and just plot the phase pace um, trajectory and the Poncari section points at the, at the later times. So now we have a simple oval trajectory and we have a single um, Poncari section point. So here we're seeing the regular steady state periodic motion. Now, is not an ellipse because it's not sinusoidal periodic motion, but it is regular periodic motion. So this is a third case of a, a different driving force. Now I've just inched up the driving force from a value of 1.05 to a value of 1.07. So I've only increased it by a couple of percent. But I did this because between 1.05, 1.07, there's a very interesting transition that happens to the, in the steady state motion that we call period doubling. And so I wanted to show you this period doubling, which is a landmark, it, which is a kind of fork in the road on the way to chaos. So same four plots again. Let's start with the simplest ones theta versus time, omega versus time, right? angular displacement, angular velocity versus time. Again, we see a period that extends beyond 100 seconds of irregular motion, where, for example, the pendulum loops the loop in both directions. Uh, but after about 120 or 110 seconds, we see that um, we have steady state motion. We see that steady state motion in this periodic pattern in the angular displacement. We see the steady state motion in the periodic pattern of the angular velocity. So we do evolve to steady state motion. Now, it's not, again, it's not sinusoidal motion, but it is periodic motion. If you look at theta, if you look at omega versus time, this doesn't look sinusoidal does look periodic. 
the plot on the top left shows this situation also. We see the irregular motion while we're in this transitory period, but we see at later times that we evolve to this uh, steady state periodic motion. We see it in these um, loops as the uh, in phase space, and we see it in the this pattern, this column of um, uh, Poincare section points. So now let's step downstairs to the two phase space diagrams. Again, I've got a phase space diagram on the left-hand side that has the entire phase space and evolution of the pendulum for the red line and all the Poincare section points for the blue points. Then on the right-hand side, I've removed the evolution of the phase space at the earlier times, and I've removed the Poincare section points at the later times. And we see the same sort of thing as we saw on the um, previous slide with alpha equals 1.05, but with one very important difference. So the same thing that we see is that if I remove the path at early times, I remove the Poincare section point, points at early times, I remove the transitory behavior, the, I remove the irregular behavior, and the plot on the right becomes much simpler. Kind of looks like the oval from the last slide. Kind of looks like the point Poincare section points of the last slide. But if you look carefully, two things to look at carefully. You see that actually there's two distinct paths in phase space. There's this path here on the right, this path here on the left. And there's two distinct Poincare section points corresponding to these two paths here. This is called periodic doubling. You can't see it in theta versus time. You can't see it in omega versus time. It's too small a difference. But this periodic motion in the pendulum at steady state is actually has a period of, of twice, twice the, that driving frequency. It's, I should say that more clearly. It has a period that's twice that driving frequency period. So when you go through one oscillation in omega, you have to go through a second oscillation in omega to complete the cycle. When you go through one oscillation in theta, you then go through a second oscillation in theta to complete the entire cycle. When you take the trajectory around this phase space orbit, you have to go round twice to complete the cycle, once through this inner path, once through this outer path. When you sample the Poincare section point, you're in the first orbit, you'll sa sample one of these points. On the second orbit, you sample the other of these points. To go through the two points, you have to go through two orbits around this phase space plot. And that's called periodic doubling. And that's on the road to chaos. <clears throat> OK, so on this plot, I'm plotting, actually, I'm graphing two values of the um, driving force. So now I've inched them up a little bit more. We did 1.0. Five, we did 1.07. Now I've added about 1%. And I've given you two values of the driving force that are they're 1% larger than the previous driving force, but these two are differing by about a part in a thousand. So a very small difference in the driving force between these two, two values of alpha. The alpha of 1.079 is over here on the left hand side. The alpha of 1.08 is over here on the right-hand side. And you see a fascinating, I think, transition between these two values of alpha. So the value of alpha 1.079 is similar to that, the pattern, the phase space trajectories, the Poincare section points look rather similar to the case of 1.07 from the last slide. So if I look at angular velocity, that's upstairs here. 
sorry, if I look at angular displacement, that's the top plot here, you see the uh, irregular behavior, the transitory period, and then you see steady state oscillations. If I look at angular velocity, that's the red plot here, you see um, the irregular behavior of the transitory period, and then you see these steady state oscillations. If you look at the phase, corresponding phase space diagram and Poincare section plots, you see these, these two red orbits here and these two blue points here. So this is clearly showing that to complete one cycle, you go through one orbit and then you'll pass through the other orbit. To complete one cycle, you go through one point and then through the other Poincare section point. So one period of this pendulum steady state is not from, say, the this peak of angular velocity to this peak of angular velocity. It's from this, I should say, this peak of angular displacement to this peak of angular displacement. It's from this peak to this peak to this peak of angular displacement. So this, again, is the period doubling. Over here on the right-hand side, now, so now we inched up the... Um, a driving force by 10th of a percent. Now, again, I've got the plot of angular displacement upstairs, angular velocity as a function of time in the middle, and then the phase space plot. So what you now see in this plot is that the you get through this transit, trans, transitory period, this transient period, after, after maybe, you know, 50 or more seconds, we start to see periodic behavior. But the period now is even longer. And the period now has, has doubled once again. And actually, you see the path that we're taking through phase space is now much more complicated. Look at this red path down here. It's no longer two ovals. We go around one oval and we go around another oval that looks very similar we're going through a much more complicated path in the phase space to complete a cycle. And so you see that in this complicated pattern in angular velocity versus time. You see that in this complicated pattern of um, angular displacement of time. And you see that now we're not just going through two phase space points, two Poincare section points. We're going through multiple Poincare section points. We've had another bifurcation is underlying that. And so this step here, I wanted to show you because it's, we had one bifurcation on the last slide. Now we've got a new bifurcation on this slide. 